Good morning. A hearty welcome to you all and to our web community. My name is EJ, and I am here with an invitation for all of you this morning. At 11.30, following our coffee hour, we are having a wonderful lunch of soup and bread that's free, along with a wonderful instruction by Doug on our Lord's Prayer. You're all welcome to come, and I hope we'll see many of you there. And thank you very much. Good morning, First Parish. I'm Brenda McDonald, Stephen Ministry Leader, and a member of the prayer group. This is the third month in a row that I've been up here. Who can tell me what happens on the second Sunday of every month? Very good. Here's a hint. You may be sitting on the reason. Look around on the pew seats. The Stephen Ministry cards are yours to take, keep, or share with a friend. Please see me or Carol Spencer LeMay with any questions. The purple caring cards are for you to write a message of thanks, concern, or get well wishes. Write the person's name on the card and put it in the offering plate for the prayer group to mail, or take the card home and mail it yourself. Both cards help all of us share God's love and care. Thank you. Good morning, church, family. How are you today? All right. Well, my name is Chris Stanley, and I have a really great fellowship opportunity for us. Uh, we're sitting around thinking we like to get together to, is that going to do that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> we like to get together and do book studies and such, but a lot of times we just end up in fellowship together. So what I came up with, with the help of Doug, was a group called Beer, Bibles, and Babes. <laughs> That's right. So it's a big kid fellowship. We're going to have dinner at Mulligan's down the street here, starting not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday night for four Wednesdays. We're going to do it like a pilot, see how it goes. We'll share a devotion, share some delicious food, and we're going to have beer, root beer. If you want a root beer float, have whatever you want, whatever floats your boat even. But just remember, a deeply religious man once said that beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. <laughs> So if you're interested, see me after, after the service and we'll share more details. Good morning. My name is Ben Steva and this is Dylan Preventure. Have you ever been at a traffic light and noticed a person with a sign asking for help? The high school class of Sunday school um, are working on a campaign for the homeless we are calling Socks for Souls. Over the next few weeks, we will be contacting local businesses for donations of socks, small travel-sized soaps, lotions, toothbrushes, toothpaste, granola bars, and small bottles of water. If you happen to have any extras of these items and would like to donate, uh, we will have a cart set up in the atrium. Thank you all for your support. Good morning, my name is Chris Gallison and I am the Director of Christian Education here at First Parish. On behalf of the First Parish Eight, those were two of them, there's another one over here, a few more in there. Um, we would like to, just, going to the National Youth Event, we would like to say thank you. Thank you so much for your fabulous support at our Panera Night last Tuesday. Panera has not released information to us as to any dollar totals but even better than that was the over 90, yes, 90 people that showed up. We felt incredibly loved. Thank you so much. Please continue to pray for us as we continue our journey toward the National Youth Event. Thank you. Every once in a while, there is an event that happens that really typifies what a church can be. 
So at one o'clock this afternoon, there will be a funeral. That funeral will be for Doris Hertzberg, who has been part of our congregation for a historical piece of time. The fellowship that will be happening, and I don't think Chris mentioned that, but there is ice cream for fellowship after worship. That's gonna be supplemented also by some food brought by the family whose um, funeral will be happening at one o'clock here. So there'll be an opportunity for the church family to celebrate youth, to understand the role that the church can play in an entire family's progression and a movement then into a funeral at one o'clock. So for those of you who knew Doris, please know that you are absolutely welcome. For those of you who did not know her, know that a little bit of the fellowship that is brought to us today is because of her love for this church. Now, I invite you to listen very carefully. Listen to the way that God's spirit works in you. Listen to the way that the chimes bring us closer to the holy. Listen with ears, with hearts, with souls. And grace is amazing. I invite all who are able and for whom it's comfortable to please stand with us that we might share the call to worship found in our bulletin. You have said to us, O oh Lord, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Grant unto us, O oh God, the joy of our faith, and the wisdom to share it with you in this hour and with each other in the hours to come.
And we have a lot of work to do, so though the bulletin says you're going to stay standing, no, be seated. And the work we have to do is in part because today one of the things we celebrate is Pilgrim Lodge Sunday. Pilgrim Lodge is an outdoor ministry of the United Church of Christ here in Maine, and I suspect Chris will be able to evoke how many of us have been touched by that ministry. But in celebration of that, I invite you to find the insert in your bulletin and let me be one and let you be many and let our voices be shared in a litany for outdoor ministry. God of all creation, we praise your holy name. We thank you for lake shores and mountain tops, for burning stars and heating hearts. We thank you for the beauty of the earth that surrounds us and fills us, for the presence of Christ in one another and the chance to find it in ourselves. We remember how Jesus withdrew to the wilderness to pray and then returned to community. We thank you for the opportunity to follow Jesus into the wilderness and to know we are an integral part of creation. We thank you for communities of faith everywhere, for monasteries, retreat centers, and outdoor ministry programs whose mission is to provide sacred space. God, please bless and protect all camps. Hear our prayers for a summer that is safe, meaningful. <laughs> bless all our United Church of Christ outdoor ministry sites and programs, staff, volunteers, and of course, campers. May we all do our part to nurture this ministry of inclusion where children and adults are encouraged to discover their true self and the divine spark within, around, and between them. For the beautiful feast that you offer. We ask for blessing and love for our friends in New Hampshire at Horton Center. Be with us in worship and song, in conversation and scripture, in balloons and variety shows, in shaving cream, wiffle ball, and picnics, in group building and laughter, in sunsets on the lake, and ice cream on the boardwalk. Let our time at camp be like a refreshing jump into the cool lake on a warm summer day, so that we may return to the world ready and willing to do your will and do our part to bring about a world of healing, reconciliation, and justice. Amen.
any other young people that like to come down front and join us? Or maybe a little bit older people want to come down front and join us? Please come on down. Okay, very nice job. I love that song you just sang. And you did a great job on the chimes, too. Um, a couple of you, oh, you did it. You took off your robes. Stand up, Lizzie and Hope. I just want everybody to see what they're wearing. And Simon has a bandana. I have a shirt. I know a couple other people have sweatshirts. Thank you, girls. You can sit down. So this morning, we're going to share a little bit about Pilgrim Lodge. And Doug talked a little bit about it, and we talked a little bit about it in our litany, but um, if we were gonna share what Pilgrim Lodge is to all our congregation here, what would you all like to say about Pilgrim Lodge? Okay, Hope, I knew I'd get an answer from you. <laughs> um, it's really fun, and it's like, you always get to go hang out in different places, and you get to do new things every day. Awesome. Maybe, Lizzie, could you share something with us? Um, it's really fun, and <laughs> um, Vespers is really nice because it's outside and really peaceful. How about Simon? Simon, you got something you'd like to share? Could you share something? I think it's refreshing because you can just unplug. Um, your devices. Awesome. Did you hear that? Dylan, you got anything to add? Okay, not right now. Okay. All right. Well, very good. That's very nice. So we're going to talk about a little bit about Pilgrim Lodge. Um, I want to ask you, is, is Pilgrim Lodge a camp just for kids? No. Who else goes to Pilgrim Lodge? Grown-ups. Grown-ups. All right. Grown-ups. And, okay, Eric, I need the first slide, please. Eric's got a couple of slides up here. So, first of all, we're going to talk about where do our Pilgrim Lodge campers come from? Well, 16% of campers have no church affiliation. That means they do not attend church. 6% of campers camp from a denomination other than the UCC church. They might be Methodist, or Baptist, or Lutheran, or Catholic. 6% of campers come from a UCC church outside of Maine, maybe like Massachusetts, or New Hampshire, Rhode Island. But 72% of campers come from UCC churches in Maine. And guess what, people? That's all of us. All of us. Next slide, Eric, please. So who is camp for? We just talked a little bit about camp is for our kids and camp is for adults. So 1% of our campers are ages seven and under. Who's seven and under in this group? Are you seven and under? Maddie, are you seven and under? So even Maddie and Evan could go to camp. Maybe like grandparents camp or family camp. 12% of our campers were ages eight to 10. Anybody 8 to 10 here? 8, 9, 10? So you could all go to camp. And what about 22% of the campers are ages 11 to 13? Anybody here 11 to 13? Sure, lots of you. 36% of campers are ages 14 to 19, and that would be Dylan's age up there. Thank you, Dylan, for being the only brave soul to come down here. And 29% of our campers are ages 20 to 80. Okay, out there, who's 20 to 80? All right, admit it. And even if you're over 80, I bet you could still go to Pilgrim Lodge. Have no fear. Okay, next slide, Eric. And thank you, Eric, for putting up these slides for me. Now, what about those deans and counselors? Last year, PL had 123 volunteer counselors and deans. Each camp session has two deans and many counselors. Now, we've sent a number of deans and counselors Marsha Schneider has been a dean and a counselor. Eric's been a counselor. Lou's been a counselor. Raise your hand when I call your name. Cindy Howard's been a counselor. I know Merle, where's Merle? Merle Steva, because he went with me one year. And Carl, you've been there. Anybody else that I don't know of? 
Dan Car oh, Chris Stanley, yes. So we've given a, we've sent a lot of these. We got another one. Oh, Allison, Chris, was that you? Yay, good. So these counselor and deans usually come from UCC churches. And as I said, First Parish has sent a lot of counselors and deans. And if you're available this year, I know Brian would love to have you back. Okay. So right now, I have a young lady who wrote an essay for the beginning of school last year about something fun she did this past summer. So I'm gonna have Lizzie Jansen come out and read her essay for us. I had a lot of fun this summer, but the funnest thing I did was go to the Pilgrim Lodge camp. PL is an overnight ch church camp in West Gardner, Maine. I was there for a week in August. I felt excited and nervous. The only person I knew there was my friend Hope from church. I had a lot of <laughs> stories to tell you. My mom and I left the house at 10 o'clock for the long ride to PL. It was a beautiful, warm day. I made a list of every town on the way there. I did it because it would help pass the time. Then we finally got there. A nice lady greeted us and gave us a card with a number on it. I was number 13. We waited in the lodge for my number to be called. After check-in, we went to cabin nine. My counselor name was Susan. She was really nice. There were four bunk beds. I, w I had a bottom bunk. Next, I did my swim test in the lake. I got a green band and that's the highest. Then we went back to my cabin and I had to say goodbye to my mom. I was sad because I was going to miss her a lot. I met a lot of girl I met all the girls in my cabin and they were really nice. We ate meals in the lodge. On Wednesday I was jumper and that's when you go into the lodge ten minutes before mealtime and set the table and put the cold food on the table. Jumpers eat first and the deans can sit at your table. Um, the deans are the leaders. I did a series of different interest groups. There were pinwheeling, line dancing, and sailboating. On the sailboat, we almost capsized. That means we almost flipped over. My friend and I both sat in the back of the boat when we were switching places. We were really scared. Then it started thundering. We, we tried to hurry back, but it took us a long time because of the current. We were relieved to get back on ground. Every day, we had Vespers morning and night. Vespers is like church, but outdoors. My favorite part was morning watch. That was very, that's when we pray and do not talk for 10 minutes. It was very peaceful. Even though I was scared and nervous, I had a lot of fun and met new friends. I have a lot of great memories from my time at PL, and I really want to go back next summer. And Lizzie is going back. Lizzie, what, are you go what camp are you going to? Destination Hogwarts. And I think Hope, Hope is, Lou's going to be a counselor there. And I think we've got two new girls. You guys signed up for Destination Hogwarts too? Anybody else going to a different camp? Dylan. Oh, Dylan's like, um, who's going? Somebody else told me. Oh, well, we have lots of others going anyway. I know Norma Gorham's going with her grandson, Theo. OK, so. I have one last thing. Oh, first of all, after church today, we have plenty of information about Pilgrim Lodge. So if you want more information, ask any of these, us, Hope and Lizzie and myself and Heather, and there's a lot of other PLers, Allison, Merle, Carl, any of us would like to give you any information you'd like about Pilgrim Lodge. We hope as many people go as possible. Okay, so now I have a riddle for you. What is yummy? and a big treat at Pilgrim Lodge. Just yell it out. Ice cream! All right, ice cream! And that's what we're gonna have at Coffee Fellowship today, ice cream! In honor of Pilgrim Lodge, thank you boys and girls, and we'll see you in church school.
Good morning. The Acts of the Apostles tells the story of the growth of Christianity after Je the disciples witnessed Jesus ascend to heaven. One of the main characters from the book of Acts is Saul, later known as the Apostle Paul. Saul was a well-educated man and a devout Jew. As a Pharisee, he thrived on enforcing the Jewish laws, particularly against those following the new Christian way. The reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verses 1 through 20, found on page 111 of the New Testament. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along, approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men traveling with Saul stood speechless because they could hear the voice but saw no one. Saul got up, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before all the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales 
fell from Saul's eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, his strength was restored. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. Amen. A little before Legos, there was a big rage among the five to ten-year-olds set. And they, uh, they had to do with a plastic toy known as Transformers. These little ingenious gizmos looked like any average robot-like alien creature. But when a youth got with it, and there was a tutored pull of a twist and a flip and a click. These small fingers could transform them into a car or a tank or a plane. Wheels and wings cleverly hidden inside the robot bodies. These toys had a dual identity fascinated by the toy's ability to change right before our very eyes. Kids made these transformers enormously popular. Any of you play with or have kids that played with transformers? Let me, let me see the audience I've got here. Okay, and Eric still plays with transformers. 25 summers ago, saw the release of yet another Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Terminator 2, or T2 as it has become affectionately known. All the characters, all the characters from the original futuristic sci-fi run for your life movie were there, but with one important difference. Schwarzenegger's character, the Terminator, had been transformed, or in this case, reprogrammed into a kind of guardian angel for the ever pursuant woman and child. So other equally death-dealing villains awaited those people, but the good guys were immeasurably helped by the protection and guidance of the former Terminator. Schwarzenegger droid had threateningly vowed I'll be back at the conclusion of that first Terminator movie. And he was. He came back, but transformed. His promise fulfilled, but he returned as a good guy. So these two examples illustrate what it must have been like for Paul and for Ananias, for Simon Peter, and for some other disciples to experience the life-turning, changing, transforming power and grace of God through Jesus. If ever there was a terminator in the Bible, it had to be Saul. He had enthusiastically earned his way onto the church's greatest enemies list. Accordingly, when Ananias was told you go over and deal with Saul, he expected nothing less than the worst nightmare you could imagine. And yet, both men, both men, are transformed from the inside out. Saul, through his encounter with the living Christ on that Damascus road, spins 180 degrees in his life orientation, the bitter well of hatred 
from which he had been drawing his sustenance is sweetened by Christ's touch and changed into an eternal spring of love and devotion. Ananias, fearful of the encounter, loathing his persecutor, is also changed by Christ's words. Openness and acceptance are now his. And he conveys that and confers that upon his brother, Saul. Simon Peter, yet another one that is transformed, filled with guilt. It wasn't all that long ago that we heard the story, denying three times that he even knew Jesus. Filled with guilt, convinced of his failure, he sees the face of the risen Christ, and although he expects the worst, judgment, condemnation, shame, guilt, what he actually guessed our welcoming words, soothing actions, and all of this a healing balm for his tortured soul. Instead of the judgment that he feared, Peter finds himself entrusted with a new mission, a new point in life, a new thing to go toward, a unique kind of authority placed upon him. The disciple who could not even stand up for Jesus on the night that he was imprisoned is now called to watch over all the members of the household of faith, guiding them and guarding them into the future. So one after another examples of transformation of good guys becoming out of the experience of what were formerly bad guys. And I think that part of what our children found so enticing, and Eric still finds enticing, about the little toy transformers, is that the robot aliens usually change from being body-shaped creatures into some sort of vehicle, some sort of plane or car or truck or train. Their transformation was usually into some form of transport that was capable of doing all kinds of things that, that, that Eric can't. Christ's transforming love empowers us on our way forward. We're moving from where we are to where God wants us to be. We're moving on our way forward as we allow that kind of transforming grace to inform who we are. We become vehicles. Each one of us become vehicles for that love. And, like Saul, we too are changed. And we too are charged with carrying Christ's good news out into the world. Under the power of that love, Saul the Terminator becomes Paul the Apostle. Perhaps, arguably, the single most influential person in the history of the church. Simon Peter becomes a vehicle to move the church itself forward into the future, safeguarding its integrity and welfare. So I ask you, are there terminators in your life? Are there individuals who live to disrupt any spontaneous outbreak of love and harmony that might accidentally and excitedly crop up? Do you know those kinds of people, those half-empty, wet-blanket kinds of folks who are terminators of any kind of joy that might spontaneously erupt? You know that type? People who seem to need to cause disruption through their chronic negativity. I know you'll be surprised, but this, these kinds of people, they even exist in churches. They seem to always have the available current statistics on declining church membership right at hand. They can come up with a dozen reasons why the next program will never work. And it's often we tried that before. And they will let you know that the church 
has just painted the new doors in the ugliest possible color. So what's to be done with soul terminators like these? Those folks that are in our homes, in our places of work, in our neighborhoods, yes, and even in our churches. What's to be done? Well, if we're to be vehicles of the way forward, we might have to go, like Ananias, buoyed up by the boldness of Christ's love in our life, and offer those terminators the transforming love and acceptance. It's not work for sissies. It's not for the faint of heart. To be able to face your terminators with the power of God's love in your life is what we're called to do and move all of creation forward. Can you imagine that you are that kind of vehicle? You and you. Oh yeah, and even you. Transforming terminators is the legacy and the job description of the church. Paul, absolutely. Peter, you bet. Constantine, Augustine, all these folks transforming lives with the power of God's love. So in all my wisdom in my first church in Vermont, I stood there full of the knowledge of God and just was full of myself as well. And I had printed in the bulletin the sermon title that the church's job is to kiss frogs. I thought it was clear. Kiss a frog turns into a prince or princess. That's our job. Well, Lena Colton was the matriarch of that church. And Lena was deaf as a post. And she sat right in the very first pew. And I went through this eloquent sermon about kissing frogs and all the power of that in our lives, and she sat there. And then I came to the conclusion, and the last hymn was sung, and I went out to the door, and I greeted people, and Lena came out. And Lena took my hand, and she said, Young man, I didn't hear a word you said, but I know there's nothing about kissing frogs in the Bible. <laughs> I got back at her the next week because it was on the leap of faith and I climbed a ladder with every point I was making. I was standing at the top of an eight-foot ladder in my younger days and at the very last point I was talking about the leap of faith and I leaped off the ladder and I landed right next to Lena Colton. She had fallen asleep <laughs> and she woke up with a great start. <laughs> The point is, we are about kissing frogs. We are about being transformers. We are about addressing the terminators in our life. That's who we are as the people of God. That's who the church is. It's very clear to me that being those kinds of vehicles for the grace of God is exactly who we are, and it is not only the best, it is the only way forward. Be, be the vehicle of God's love. Amen.
friends, please be seated. I want to share a few names and circumstances and then invite the deacons to come down and allow you to share the prayers that you've brought with you today. Prayers of joy and celebration for the surgical intervention that will make the life of Dan Dearborn hopefully much better. Dan received surgery. I'm looking around to see if anyone knows whether he's actually home right now. He is home now. Thank you. Thank you very much, bud. So in the hospital, some surgical intervention. He thought it was carpal tunnel. Turns out it's actually some impingement. Healing. Healing now at home. I was going to lift up, and I still will, John Taylor, who had some intervention with his leg, but then there he is sitting over there, and it won't stop us from praying with you and for you, John, and perhaps for Margaret as well. Got word from Priscilla this morning that Bob Kelly is on his way to hospice. Well, see, yeah, that is, there is a sadness around that. However, there's also an empowerment about that. It is a way of choosing how one is in these days. And so we offer prayers of support for Priscilla, but also for Bob as well. And then, for this aspect anyway, finally, Fred Connolly, actually Freddie, not the dad, but the son. The son who is now out on the left coast, the son who will come here and share another film in the near future with us and we'll have a wonderful dialogue. The son who called up his parents and said, Mom, Dad, I'm an alcoholic. The son who is seeking treatment, the son who went to his first meeting, the son who has friends gathering around him and has asked that we gather around him in prayer as well for his journey toward wholeness, for Freddie. Prayers for Mary Ann Cook Christianberry, who, um, whose mom died. Prayers for Marcia and for the family as we prepare to celebrate the life of Doris. And prayers also for Rosemary Guptill who will be celebrating, if that's the, quite the right word, 20 years, an anniversary of 20 years since her husband died. And just even this morning, she said, you know, sometimes it feels just like yesterday. And I lift that up to you because grief has its own time and its many faces. And sometimes we go on and think that you know, we can't possibly still be grieving. And Rosemary reminds us that our hearts are still full and still touched. And so I lift that up and I lift you up in our prayer that we might carry you as well in this time. So those are the prayers that I brought today. I'm wondering as the deacons come about halfway down if you would be bold with your hand, and rise it up. Rick, if you're here with Lou, please. You've got to be more bold than that, Lou. Lift that hand up. Thank you. I lift prayers of joy and celebration as it is uh, National Siblings Day. So prayers go out to John, Nancy, Lisa, and Jim Cashmar. National Sibling Day, yeah? Wow, okay then. Thanks be to God for s siblings. Rick, if you're right there with Linda. This is a prayer I give every day and it fits with your sermon so perfectly. I ask that God soften the hearts of those who are angry, filled with grudges and hate. Amen. It's good morning. A friend of mine from work, uh, his wife, his name is Chris, and she's recently undergone a cardiac procedure and is healing. I ask for her prayers for her. For Kristen. Prayers of God's healing. And Adria, grab that microphone as it goes by. Um, my second cousin, Nick, is asking for prayers as he raises money to go on a missions trip to Guatemala. 
he asks for prayers and support because he's never been in an airplane before and he's a little bit scared. So, prayers for him. So the impulse for mission, balancing the fear of flying. Okay, for Nick. Glenn Ellen. I asked for prayers for a longtime friend, a girl, a woman who was a bridesmaid in our wedding many years ago. Um, she was one of the first females in a program at the Navy Yard. She had eye surgery this week and must lay parallel to the ground for the next three weeks, and it's very hard. Wow. For the strange road that sometimes healing takes, for her healing, we offer our prayers. Over here, Nancy, with Robert. Doug, I'd ask for continued prayers for my friend Matt and his wife Ashley, who are still in a struggling place after the miscarriage that Ashley suffered a few weeks ago. And I'd list up my mother-in-law uh, after the loss of her brother Bill. The services are coming up, and the world's a different place for her now. Mm. Isn't that the truth? Yes. Nancy, you're right there. Lift up prayers for David Vardaman and Terry Foster. David lost his mother last week in Iowa, just two days short of her 92nd birthday. And Terry Foster was music director here for so very long. Thank you for that. Doug McCrae. A prayer for all the caregivers, whether it be my wife, who's done a great job taking care of me, or the nurses or the CNAs who, who take care of all these folks as we heal. and transition into different phases of our lives. So a prayer for caregivers. And the difficult job that can be with certain patients. <laughs> EJ first, and then Frank. Several prayers. For Joyce, that I work with, who slipped on the ice last week, broke eight teeth and her jaw. Uh, she's had surgery, she's doing well, she's at home now. For Brady, the 18-month-old little boy who just began chemotherapy for a rare kidney cancer. He's doing great, uh, just a happy, wonderful little boy. And for uh, all those who have no one else to pray for them, and for you, Doug, and our congregation as we move forward, may we be guided with his guidance. Amen. Chris? We recently got back from Turkey, and when we were there, two of the bombings that the most recent bombings happened while we were there. And so our prayer is really for the people of Turkey to have uh, peace in their hearts, that they're protected. And I, I believe that only comes through an encounter with Jesus Christ, to know that they're going to be personally saved, but also just peaceful inside, to know that what they're going through, they're not doing alone. And that also begets a conversation I had with some friends this week that aren't believers, just that uh, Christ will reveal himself to us in small ways and large ways so that our hearts are softened to receive that and also that we're praying about it. For all of that and more, amen. Rick down here with Frank. Yes, uh, I'd just like some prayers for our friend Cheryl who's um, going to be needing some heart surgery done in another month or so. Um, I just thank you for your prayers and thoughts on that. Thank you, Frank. Rick, you, you, you got all the bulk of the work today down here with me. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody here for all your prayers and support for my mother while she was traveling through her difficult road. And to let you know that she held you all in her heart, hoping even while she was coming out of ICU, she would be well enough to come up here and be with you all. And. Um, I know that I know how much this family meant to her and all of her choir friends and the whole church community. 
And I just want to say thank you from her. I know how much it meant to her and Doris, as you all know. And, uh, and we hope that we'll see you at her service. Thank you so much. Prayers of thanksgiving for a life well lived. Um, I, I would like to ask for help for my sister, Cynthia Fay, who's suffering with four, uh, stage four ovarian cancer. And, uh, that's a, a tough one, but she's very brave and strong. But she may know God's presence and healing intent. Tony? Continuing prayers for my daughter, Nanette. Uh, she's gone through the first step. She had her surgery Thursday, and so far is doing pretty good. And for Nanette's parents, as they travel with her as well. Pam? Continued prayers for the granddaughter of Lois Milks, little Carolyn, as she prepares to have bilateral brain surgery in a few weeks. Young teenager, as I recall, is that right? No, no, I think eight years old. Eight years old. Ah. A twin. A twin, though, right. From the web community, Jack. Uh, from Freddie Conley, prayers of thanksgiving for the blessings of the incredible people in his life that have offered love and hope and support as he battles his alcoholism. He says, five days sober and counting. <laughs> He's also thankful for the media system that allows him to be part of the First Parish community from across the country. Also from Becky Morgan, uh, Doris Hertzberg's daughter. As we know, Doris's family is in church with us today. And um, Becky wants to say that it's a blessing to be able to join them from a distance. And she would like to thank everyone um, in the congregation for the love and support uh, of her mother over the years. And then lastly, just a kind of a tardy comment from me that dates back to Palm Sunday. Uh, as you know, many of us went out on the curb to encourage the runners of uh, Mary's Walk. And the next day I was kind of taken aback as I was in school. Uh, one of my colleagues came up to me and said, were you standing on a corner in Main Street in Saco waving a palm? And I said, yes, I was. I, and I was surprised that I didn't see him. But it is good to know that our efforts were, did not go unnoticed. My friends, let our choir bring us together, join our hearts, our souls, take a deep breath, let us pray. most glorious and gracious God, surrounded by the beauty of this day and the beauty of this sanctuary and the beauty of the people before us and behind us and to either side, it is easy to give you thanks and we do so joyfully. And for the people that we have lifted up in prayer, those whose journeys are very difficult, those whose journeys may be coming to an end, those whose journeys have informed our living. For all of this, O oh gracious God, we give you thanks. We sense your presence, and we reflect and rejoice. 
And for those prayers that have not been spoken out loud, for those prayers that have remained in the silence of our hearts or deep in the folds of our minds, even those prayers, O oh God, we lay before you. Those prayers that are without words, those prayers that are yearnings and hungers and desires and intentions, we bring all of this to you. And who, who but you have an embrace wide enough to bring this all in? Gracious God, for the witness to the power of your way of love, for those who are now with us only in our memory and through our prayer, for those we have yet to meet but will make a powerful connection, and for the way you draw us in to be vehicles of your grace. Thank you. Thank you. Hear our prayers. Guide our steps. Use our lives and hear us as we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite your participation in the offering, and I invite it not as a duty, although it might be, not even as a spiritual discipline, although certainly it is, but I invite you to participate in the offering by the sheer joy of our lives being so abundantly full that we have something to share with others. And so I invite this participation in the joy of the faith at this time. God, we give you thanks for these gifts, 
in the basket behind me, in the shawl, on the communion table, in these plates, in these pews, within this building. Gracious God, powerfully multiply them in all ways through the power of your love, that they may indeed be ambassadors of your good news in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. And, and there's always an and, as you go forth from this place, as you go into the fellowship filled with ice cream and, and wonderful food to celebrate a life, as you go into the rest of the day, as you may return for the memorial service, as you go out into the world, you are the ambassadors of God's love known through Jesus Christ. You are the vehicles of transforming power. Take your role seriously and joyfully. Go forth in God's power. Go forth in God's peace.